How could we ever get you to miss us if we never go away, Jimmy? Uh, Akira Volume 5 is what's going to be discussed today. My name is Ed Piskor. I'm Jim Rugg. The great Frank Whiteley is in the house with us to discuss this book in our shoot interview. I believe he brought it up a little bit, uh, talking about seeing Tetsuo and stuff on the uh, aircraft carrier and how it looked like people had weird masks. So we'll get into some of that conversation. Uh, up front, I want to um, implore everybody to like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so we can notify you when new vids are available. That mitigates the kayfabe effect, uh, which is whenever we talk about something, the video goes live uh, by midday, early afternoon. The books we talk about sometimes are, are not able to be found on the internet. And uh, if they are, prohibitively expensive. And if you guys watch the video to the very end, that uh, helps goose the YouTube algorithms, pushes our videos out to other comic book loving YouTube people who don't necessarily see uh, our videos all the time, helps us grow the channel, grow our numbers, uh, helps make it possible for us to keep bringing uh, regular videos to to the crowd, man. We've got 60,000 plus subscribers, only 10% to the final goal of uh, 600,000, man. So we got a ways to go. Frank, thanks for coming by, man. Oh, pleasure, pleasure to be by. Here's a, here's a question that I have, man. We, there was that, that, that great documentary on you, uh, that half hour piece. And mm -hmm. we were having a discussion before, man, like when you were sort of laying down and you had these stacked up Akiras underneath your head, like, were you taking a nap or was that like spine alignment exercise? Yeah, it's, it's a thing called the semi-supine position. And what you do is you lie flat on your back with your knees raised. So you pull your feet towards your bum and you have your knees raised. And it's to, it's, it's to flatten your spine. But rather than have your head on the floor or on a cushion, you're supposed to raise your head, the back of your head, to suit the curvature of your spine which is different for different people, of course. And my posture is pretty bad. So what you do is you stand against a wall and you measure, like with your with your heels and your butt and your shoulder blades against the wall, and you measure the distance from the back of your head to the wall. And like one of my sons has got a slightly dodgy back and the distance for him is like two fingers. And for me, it's like four fingers. You know, and then you add your thumb to that, and that's how many books you need. Um, so I I can't even remember. I haven't done it for ages because my back's been good, but I can't actually remember what my my uh, which volumes I had to use. <laughs> that was going to be the next oh. question: How many volumes of uh, Acura are required to get the the perfect supine uh, yeah. position? I don't know. I feel like I feel like a five is one of the largest. And it looks like it looks like three is the smallest. Yeah. I can't remember what combination <laughs> I had. <laughs> I guess we'll have to go back to the video, man. So uh, we were debating beforehand, like which which volume should we take a look at, man? This is the 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 great uh, the dust jacket is off of the uh, hardcover from the great Akira box set that came out uh, five years ago or so, uh, or the Dark Horse version that is like the classic one that we were able to get in black and white for pretty much the first time. Uh, we're going to opt for the Dark Horse version just because it opens up uh, easier. And with that means that it the art is inverted so that it can be read, you know, le left to right the, the, the way we do. Um, I always think whenever I go through uh, unflipped manga, yeah. I think about like directional devices and mm -hmm. reading and stuff like that. And it's incredible how well both of these work from either direction. You know, like movement, it always feels like the movement is just tip top and it looks great like i don't notice like skewed faces yes. and all that kind of shit yeah, do you ever do you ever do that thing frank like uh check check in your math man on your on your artwork and, and look in at your art in oh yeah always yeah i used to do it um if the paper was thin enough i would turn it round and hold it up against the window um or the the light if it was nighttime um if it wasn't thin enough i would hold it in front of a mirror yeah and it, and obviously when i'm working digitally it's really easy i just flip it all the time sometimes what i'll do is i'll do the underdrawing then flip it and kind of redraw it and flip it again and uh, keep doing that until i feel it's it's somewhat acceptable it's, it's funny because i get that thing that sometimes i i draw things and it turns out exactly the way i want it first time 
And other times I can just keep redrawing the same face or the same hand and it's just... And eventually you have to just let it go, you know? We had uh, Walt Simonson on for, for an interview and he was talking about drawing the profile of some face and he just couldn't let go of the ultimate contour, but he just couldn't place that eyeball where it should have been. And eventually he was just like, fuck it. Like, just let it slide, man. <laughs> I always think that's stuff that most readers just don't notice. We beat ourselves up over that stuff, but we know it. And I feel like most of the time, you know, it's off by such a small amount. Like with the artist edition, sometimes you'll see where they've shifted a line a 16th of an inch, you know, and you'll see the white out next to it. And it's like, no reader is picking this up. Yeah, that, but that's the part that makes Jaime Jaime that's and shit right. like that, you know? <laughs> you know that's who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Those, it's, it's the thighs. It's the thighs on the Love and Rockets girls, man. It's like pencil line, pencil line, pencil line, white outline, white outline, and then the perfect Jaime thigh line to give that tensility, yes. that squish, all that stuff, man. All right, man, so let's crack this thing open. We'll put this to the side, man. Crack open our door course joints. I actually gave my Door Course comics to a friend uh, after I got that box set and was just like, dude, treat this with grace, man. This is my Akira. I've been reading this for years. Do you know something to mention straight away? When you guys asked me to do this, obviously I went back and, and looked at volume five to kind of refresh my, my memory. And for the last two nights, um, I actually just read the whole thing again, um, which was an absolute pleasure, of course. Um, and then like half an hour before speaking to you, I dug out the the box set where it's back to front by my way of thinking. Right. And uh, I noticed that the, the first few pages that are painted are printed the same in both volumes. Whenever they brought translated... Um... Lone Wolf and Cub to America. I remember reading interviews and stuff, and it wasn't it wasn't a one for one. It wasn't just inverting the pages, it, because especially with Lone Wolf and Cub, where there's all this pomp and circumstance to the hand that is supposed to hold a samurai right. sword and uh, uh, sort of the curve of the sword and the way the kimonos are supposed to be, you know, um, buttoned up or whatever. Uh, it had to be a certain way. So they would use the exact same image sometimes, but they would have somebody come in and flip all the swords. So it's never necessarily a one-for-one. One. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. they even move panels in weird ways. So like that could be a very sick rabbit hole for us to go down if we start <laughs> if we start doing that stuff. But, but I, I'm glad you mentioned that for sure because sometimes they might invert an image, but sometimes they won't. Yeah, it's a great note. The um, I don't know if you read Blade of the Immortal, but that's one where they didn't exactly, he didn't want it flipped, but each panel is actually cut and rearranged for each page so yeah. that it reads left to right, but the images haven't been flipped over. And it's one of the weirdest reading experiences because the directional devices do seem to be like opposite. But the great thing mm -hmm. is like after three pages, you're into this world where it's like the language is different and it's just this, I don't know, it's almost a different unique reading experience as a result of that. I look at this two-page spread with this aircraft carrier and it's like each of these wings is bent up in different ways in various states of uh, trans transformation or whatever. And it's like he didn't have to do that, but he did. Frank, that's the kind of stuff that I appreciate with your artwork, even where there's like these subtle things, this subtle tender mm -hmm. love and care that happens in the background where it's like, wow, that, that's, that's the stuff that separates like, you know, the champs from the chumps. I would look at this stuff and be amazed by the water. Yeah. Because like water to me is always the impossible thing to depict. And this looks like a photo. Yeah, it does. And you look close and it's pretty simple, but it still looks like a photo of water. Do you know, speaking about the water as, a, as an example, I love the colored pages, but I actually prefer his his ink work. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he's he's fantastic at, at, at doing the, I don't know if it's gouache or what he uses, but um, what he does just with ink, ink and like a tone, is just phenomenal. And the water is is, is one of those things. But um, yeah, I'm, it's, a, it's a strange thing, you know, like, um, you know, the, it's just the opening few pages that are painted and then the rest of it's... It's um, ink work. One of those weird things, certainly about uh, about the 
vernacular of Japanese comics. Well, I, I was told by somebody that they, it was like part of the magazine format that they had there. Um, that was what accounted for it. You know, it's cool that you mentioned that, man. Like I went to, uh, I visited Kodansha and went to their archives where they have bound copies of all of Young magazines. And I was taking a look at uh, the serialization of Akira. And this is shown off in the Akira Club book that comes with the big box set. But there are mm -hmm. absolutely many pages that are in the magazine format that don't make it to the final Tanko Bon mm -hmm. uh, editions. And some of them are beautifully painted, like the scene where, where Tetsuo with the, with the clown gang, like they're trying to smack him with that like uh, bike chain with like nuts and bolts and shit. And he stops it and he does like a David Cronenberg joint to the dude's head. It's beautifully painted. It is not in the Tanko Bon. It's it's done in uh, line art, mm -hmm. and it, it's paced differently. So, you if you get a hold of those young magazines, you 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 get to see maybe a couple dozen Otomo pages that don't make it in here, and the in volume one, the very first like the the um, explosions, it's done three different times because in the first Tanko Bond, like from Japan, it looks different than what we have, and in the magazine, it's way different probably speaks to the perfectionist nature yeah. of Tomo, which every page does, but having that ability to tighten things up or change them or, or correct the thing that, you know, it's that hand that you draw over and over again. Each time you uh, reproduce it, you get a chance to maybe like fix that thing that's been nagging at you since it was first, uh, first printed. Frank, after rereading the entire uh, run, like each, each of the books, each of them feels like a really satisfying episode. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when I started this, I mean, like right from right from the first pages, you know, like he's he's doing so much all the time. He's ticking so many boxes. Um like you can feel the you can feel the the wind and the atmosphere and the noise when they're coming off the, the helicopter onto the deck of the ship. You know, like um in the the pages that follow, you know, like I mean, even just like the body language of the, the way they interact, the way they greet each other, the way they walk down corridors, everything, there's, there are no panels where he's just kind of like freewheeling. Everything is, everything's considered and everything's, everything's like posed and composed and rendered to, to a really satisfying, um, a really satisfying finish. Um, this scene that's coming up, when uh, all these these uh, kind of rogue experts from from different places around the globe are being introduced to each other, most of them for the first time, some of them have met before, and it's it's so much like being at a comic convention, you know. <laughs> and some of the some of the other creators you've met before, and some of them you just know them by their work, and it's a pleasure to meet them, and they have that kind of polite deference with each other and it's just you know like quite apart from the the quality of the drawing um just the just the kind of observation of the way people actually interact it's just everything about it is absolutely spot on it was, it was such a pleasure to go back to this i haven't i actually haven't looked at akira for a few years um so it was really great to go back to it whenever uh, i got to the sequence with all these people i like that you mentioned it. it's like a uh, you know cartoonists getting together because like my mind was going to um like imagining what it must be like on the international space station when you have these scientists from a, a bunch of different countries but like they don't care about all the geopolitical nonsense down here because it's like i need to rely on you or else i'm dead and you know all bets are off when, when you're up there this dr stanley simmons i was thinking that this is like a kubrick kind of Oh, I uh, thought Stanley Kubrick as well because of the name. Yeah, and he and he he has a lot of uh, reverence for Kubrick's work, and and Kubrick, like you just said about the things you see in each of these panels, Kubrick is that kind of obsessive in terms of like the imagery that uh, that he inserts into every frame. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that we make. Uh, we appreciate you guys supporting our projects and the current stuff that we have on the shelves right now. 
Jim Rugg, Hulk Grand Design, both issues, uh, Monster and Madness, are out there on the stands. These are the regular covers. Comic shops out there, you know what your marching orders are. You know how to stack these on the shelves. And uh, you got these other variant covers that you could get your hands on to support the, uh, the, the work. You got the Jeff Darrow cover for Madness. You got the Ed McGinnis cover for Madness. And with the uh, first issue, Monster, Peach Momoko, the Eddie P, and the Marcos Martin variant covers. Congratulations, Jimmy. I know this was a long project in the works. The other stuff that Jimmy has in print, Plain Jane's, the first young adult graphic novel, and various volumes of the hardcover graphic albums of Street Angel are still in print still in good comic shops, still can be ordered online in volume, support the work. Right now on the stands, uh, as per the Ed Piscor comics that are out there, Red Room, Trigger Warnings, issue one, two, and potentially issue number three are out there in the wild. Issue two, the Pumpkins issue, look at that for a splash page, man. You can uh, get these comics online uh, at Fantagraphics website and various comic shops. It is banned in 26 countries. It is banned in 10 comic shops. But you can also read these comics before they hit paper on uh, my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there. Uh, last season's Red Room uh, efforts, Red Room, the Antisocial Network, trade paperback out there in the wild collecting uh, four issues of comics and lots of extra material. The works that I have out there in the wild right now, I do think WYSIWYG is currently out of print, but if you see it, scoop it up. Four volumes, Hip Hop Family Tree, including two giant box sets and 12 issues of comics. The guys at Fantagraphics just told me my royalty statements have hit Clausian and Hernandez <laughs> Brothers numbers, 42 pages of uh, royalty statement, Jimmy. And uh, the Grand Design that started them all, three volumes, X-Men Grand Design, including an omnibus that is out of print and hard to find. But if you see it, scoop it up. Now that we're done paying the bills, back to the video. I think you can I actually see the Kubrick references sometimes, particularly when he's when he's drawing corridors with yeah. patterned carpets or tiled floors. or And it, he often goes for that symmetry rather than the rule of thirds, which is more common in, in cinema. I think the note on observation but, is a good one, too. I, I feel like that's a conversation I've had with other cartoonists. Jaime Hernandez comes to mind again. But that ability to observe seems to be paramount for good cartooning. And uh, I think it's a good note to go through this book with that in mind. Mm -hmm. It grounds the yeah. fantasy very well. Makes so much sense that the, the, the mangaka who's creating this will also have a film career, especially in a scene like this where you have Kay and Kaneda after what two volumes three two and a half volumes of being separated finally uh see each other and it's paced so cinematically yeah. but it has a it's a great humor piece it's so great to have yeah. the backs of people going up and the fronts of people going down whenever you flip to see canada yeah, yeah that's uh yeah. that's good you know you get your your uh close-ups where nothing else matters you see this mm -hmm. guy entering stage left obscured with the hug and then the moment of realization. Yeah. <laughs> Get the fuck away from me. As Kay sits there, man. Yeah, and they're just looking at each other. It's it's pitch perfect. Yeah. So many greatly composed scenes throughout this thing. And also it felt like uh in this in this volume, it was an uh an exercise for Otomo. He he built all these characters, and he's really good at splitting characters up and pairing them off and seeing how they interact with one another. So he's doing a version of that here, and he always has this really great kind of like logical way to bring everybody back. You know, it's like, go off, have your adventures uh, with disparate personalities, and then let's bring everybody back for the, for the finale. That number 51 makes me think about the, uh, the Kubrick kind of uh, awareness of what you're doing with every detail. Room 237. Yeah, I mean, Area 51, right? Yeah. I guess he invented these things, too. You'll see a Masamune Shiro fuck with this kind of weird spider tank thing in um, Ghost in the Shell and Dominion Tank Police. Mm -hmm. Frank, do you remember how you encountered Akira? Did you see the movie first? the Like the Marvel epic books? or No, it was back in, um, I think, 1989 or 1990, around about that time. And I had... I was doing Electric Soup at the time, um, which Glasgow Underground comic. And one of the other guys who worked at the 
that was with us. Um, he was called Rob McCallum, and Rob's now a, he's a storyboard artist. Uh, he's done Pacific Rim and Dawn of the Dead and all sorts of things, Star Trek and everything. And he, but Rob was really into comics, and I'd been away from comics, you know, like for a lot of my teenage years and art school years. And uh, so this was me just getting back into comics, and um, I remember he he gave me. One of the was it Epic that did the kind of the square bound volumes. Um, I think I mentioned it the last time I was talking to you guys about the, and I appreciate the fact that you've you've picked volume five, which includes the my first introduction to uh, Akira, and in that episode we have Tetsuo uh, fusing with the the fighter jet, and. Uh, and then there's the conversation with the, the bars in a, I, I think it was a Lady Mayako's a shrine, the, the bars in the background that look like, a, they look almost like prison bars. And my initial reaction was this guy can draw anything, but I couldn't understand why his faces were so kind of simple and cartoony. And a, I very quickly, um, obviously, a, got on board with it. But um, that was... So later on in this volume is the, is the was absolutely my first introduction to Akira. Definitely call that out when, when we get to that section. Uh, I linger here with Lady Miyako, Miyako because uh, it just reinforces that idea that we talked about in previous episodes. And it's been a while since we did Akira, man, so we might as well bring it back up. But how it's such a unique piece of uh, pop culture or just a story where... Uh, the the anime comes out after like the first half of the manga is completed. So when you watch the anime, that's like Otomo's chance to perfect the first half of his story. But then he has to kayfabe the final part. And you watch that last part of Akira and it's like a little... Eh, eh, eh. So he does that, this this material first in the anime. Mm -hmm. So now he can go back and do you know, the more sincere version, the, the, the more considered version in manga form. And I say that because Lady Miyako shows up in two seconds and is toast <laughs> really quick in that cartoon, man, but plays a way bigger part in the narrative of, of the manga, as, as well as everybody else, as you can imagine, with something that's, you know, 8,000 pages when a flick is an hour and a half. <laughs> They argue over what to call this, and they land on juvenile A. Yeah. I wonder if there's something lost in translation there. <laughs> you know, and, and then they drive it home. You know what juvenile A yes. stands for, right? <laughs> right? And then there's like, ah, Project A, Akira. Yeah. Yeah. See this. See this top panel, a uh, top left, uh, the other page. Yeah. And this guy, this guy hasn't touched his dinner. He's just chain smoking and talking. <laughs> you know. Genius. Yeah, that's like that thing. Yeah, it's like, just... When we were going through Ghost World, and, and like you could tell a lot by the characters by what they chose at the diner. Yeah, a lot of body language on all of these characters that's even unique to them. It's not just their shapes, but even the way they mm -hmm. move. He's so good at the <clears throat> bottom three-quarter view of his characters. And, and like those those faces, man, they're, they're anchored. Dude. All, all, those, all those pieces are where they should be. Yeah. So this is his chance to to get the Colonel and Kay together. You know, we haven't seen that pairing mm -hmm. yet. So, like, let's see what that's like. How about that reflection? Mm -hmm. he, he he does this several times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even look at the architecture. I mean, you know, like, he could have made that so much simpler for himself, but he made it so much more interesting for us. There was a mangaka I met while I was out there, and he was a hentai mangaka but he was a uh, an assistant to a to a bigger name mangaka for several years before he did his own like you know porno comics or whatever in order to get to be the assistant uh the assignment was the homework was to take some of those two-page spreads from the volume six with the cityscapes go home trace uh one of these cityscapes the double page spreads bring it back the next day if you could if you could capture that perfectly with that speed and be back here next day like you got you got a job you could be my assistant wow he does certain things like the the tones are interesting right because like he he uses it in like 
sort of both ways where it's like color but also shadow and and that's that's two different approaches to it Mm-hmm. What is this? Yeah, like is that a grate or is that just... No, what is how's is it drawn because oh, it's yeah. perspective. It looks like it's a screen tone except there's a perspective on it. Is there perspective or is it isometric? I don't know. Like I know there's an angle, yeah. but but are, are all those lines going the same way I, and you just bring it down with the T square because it's also uneven like it could be done by hand. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> That's a lot of work for it could by be. hand. Yeah. But it might be, you know, like you see it in different places. These are all parallel lines, which obviously a T-square easy enough to make. But again, it has that uneven feeling. So is somebody ruling all of those in by hand? I'd love to see these pages. Have you ever seen original uh, Akira pages? Did you go to that art show or anything? Um, no. I, I saw uh, some pages for, like the guys who did Naruto are doing a, another series at Shonen Jump. And when they get down to crunch time, you'll see scotch tape pages were like, literally panels are given out to assistants uh, yeah. to go handle and then cobble it all back together. Like, how do you even imagine this? What does that start as? Frank, tell us, man. What's the secret, dude? <laughs> What's the secret? How do you do this? Oh, that, that's really it's why beyond me. We, we need you to, to, to school me. us. Do you keep a morgue file? Because, I mean, you've done some really interesting architecture in your comics is is that something that you have reference for do you think I, d- I don't have much of a morgue file the, the closest thing i had to a morgue file was a um, my mum bought me a a reader's digest one a month volume a mail order book called a people in places and it, it was like it was different countries around around the world and um and it was just photographs of like peasants, rich people, cars, architecture. And um, but obviously like and I used to I used to go to I used to go to libraries. Um, we've got an amazing reference library in Glasgow called the Mitchell. And um I used to go there if I had something specific that I had to to reference. But of course now that would be the internet, you know, like the idea of the the morgue file is is less important than it used to be. Do you have a do you have a rule of thumb when you use a Bing image search or something? Do you make sure that you don't even start looking until you hit page five of uh, search results? No, no, I've got no rules. No. I've seen uh, I've absolutely used an image that I saw in another person's comic. <laughs> <laughs> I used to see like the same artist would have like the same airplane three or four times over over several books. I, Pete Marisi. <laughs> I don't even know if you you wouldn't even remember this man. But you and I used the same photo when we did like a Pittsburgh related thing for like an that observatory. Makes sense. That makes sense. Hey, I love the lighting. Uh, the way Sick. this is like that projection, you know, where the, the light is behind her and she's cutting into yeah. it. This this ruins cutting into it. And then this almost looks like pencil. It does. In the smoke. Yeah, it's like some like real fine way of like chipping those dots off. Frank, do you watch Men Ben ever? The, the Naoki no. Urasawa with the Japanese mangaka, like what? Like, Welcome to a new obsession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's real good, man. Okay. It's, it's so good. Okay. In, fa- in fact, uh, the guy who do you remember Mother Sarah, um, the the Dark Horse comic that Otomo wrote, but it was drawn by a different fella. Like, there's a whole episode mm-hmm. with that dude. That's cool. And you just see all their tricks of the trade and shit, man. Like chipping off the dots and just watching the little dots fl- flick away, man. The storytelling here too, like it was like another noteworthy piece where you see the boys, like you see an awareness. And then you see the skeleton, and like yeah. the skeleton is that one. The utter disrespect, man, just tossing heads. Yeah, yeah. See, even the that that building there in the corner, the the hotel they're in, and it's got this kind of. Um, it looks like the Botticelli's, the birth of Aphrodite. You know, where she's standing on the shell. Mm-hmm. But just tiny. just that kind of that idea that you. You give a building that you're going to keep going back to, you give it some character so that it's, you know, um, so that it's instantly recognizable. Yeah, it's literally a, nice a landmark. Mm-hmm. I feel like you see Mike Mignola do that with a lot of details where he'll be, you know, he'll be zooming in on whatever that art is, the stained glass, the sculpture. I admire the uh, mm-hmm. the storytelling, though, right? Like we get the point of view of, of from this upper ledge and then we pull back and we see the character there but it reads and it's the same deal here you know yeah. it's like here's our building and now we're zooming in we're going into the doorway 
like the setup is very clear. It reminds me of like when Frank Miller talks about get it, encountering manga and how readable it was, even though he couldn't read the language. Um, it yeah. feels like this has that quality. There are- it's funny that 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 first uh, panel that you mentioned uh, again, top left, uh, that actually reminds me of the the Wally Wood thing about the twenty two yes panels or you know I f- I feel like that's in there somewhere. <laughs> There's a lot of great filmic uh, transitions that we're going to see visually uh, in in this piece, man. Here goes your Kubrick uh, carpet patterns, man. Yeah. But but like with tatters, and you see the wood floor underneath, and you see shadow mm. on that carpet, and it's that mm. um like that one point perspective. You know, you talk about the rule yeah. of threes, where like this is kind of centered, everything centered in that panel. Yeah, which is very Kubrick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's so good for that too. Imagine some of those uh, two, three panel pages in Domu, like inside the boy's bedroom with the uh, airplanes hanging from the ceiling. And like that little old man just shows up right in that window. Also showing off like our background, our, our throwaway details, a bike, an engine. Like Dude, imagine having to draw that as extras in the background. Just even drawing a tire in perspective <laughs> and, and getting it to look right, man. That's so easy to screw up. Uh, this is where we start to see the Joker is going to have different clown paint every time we see him from now on, man. And he's a different character now. Way different character. The enemies have the common enemy, so now they're friends. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, Frank, we're going to be able to ask you about that one uh, Oracle dude with the big eye and ask you about oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Flex. <laughs> I just realized that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, looking like a badass. And here we go, man. We got the tandem. They need to go see Lady Chiaco. She he fi- she finds out that she's alive, wants to be reunited with her auntie. Yeah, I love Chiaco's, uh, like, her arc in this story because she's such a badass early on, and to get to see her kind of survive through and, and to come back in this volume is uh, pretty great. It's it's so cool how he like he builds these characters and then he deprives you of these characters for some time. Like when Tetsuo goes away for a while, it's it's like a book and a half where he's gone, and when he shows back up again, he's regal. He's a bad motherfucker, dude. And this is your getting your superhero posse ready, right? <laughs> Look at the jumpsuit I found. Yeah, like everybody thinks like. When you're a kid and you hear about Akira and you see it and all that stuff, everybody thinks Kaneda is Akira. And everybody thinks it's like about being on a red motorcycle and doing cool shit. That was a very small amount of time. So we need to get this boy on a bike again. ASAP. And it's almost like his his OG. Yeah, very close. And who knew Joker was such a tinkerer? Can you imagine? Frank, how long would this panel take you to draw, man? Oh, OD. OD at least, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you gotta do a couple in that in that same sequence. Yeah. Even just like cockpits. You know, like that that's such a s- simple panel on one hand and impossible to draw on the other hand. There's like an awareness. It's like when we talk with Jeff Darrow and he talks about like, you know, there's a love nut here and uh, a piston there and he just like he understands the shit that he's drawing. And he said that like when he worked at at the uh what food factory was it? It wasn't Nabisco, Quaker Oats or something. He, he worked at a food factory and just like around all kinds of machinery. So you, so it's like you just internalize a little bit of it and see how certain things work. Rick Veach is good at that too, man. I think reading this comic makes me want to be that way. Yeah. There's so much like the world building feels like you're doing the work of actually like how do you draw this thing or that thing to make it believable? Except in this case, it's like an entire world, right? From ships to building rubble and engines it certainly makes you have to raise your game. Frank, do you ever mess with like uh, Masamuni Shiro, Ghost in the Shell, and, and those kinds of... Yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen a bunch of that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Here's our guy. Wow. With the eye. Ah, uh, it is, yeah. Yeah, man. A little inspiration? Yeah, well, the the, the, the character in Flex Mentalo was um, Lord Limbo, he was called. But um, Grant, as... Grant often does. Um, he 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 gave me a, a a character design that he'd already drawn, um, and he's a pretty decent artist. Um, so I just copied his design in my style. But um, 
yeah, I, I don't doubt that there was one of a number of influences for that character was uh, this blindfolded guy with the eye drawn in his forehead. It's a, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty great design. I love that the drawing of the eyeball is like yet another line. Yeah. And, and, and we'll see it with like graffiti and stuff Absolutely. scattered through this volume. Same deal where it's like drawings on top of what look like real drawings. Have you ever done that, man, where you got some friends to like put a little gra graffiti on your walls and stuff like that? I've thought about it. I've, I've thought with it. Street Angel of like soliciting graffiti from all my car comics friends and then putting that in, in I've backgrounds done that and stuff, on walls. Man. And then you do. You get that extra line. Everybody does that, I think. If you have to do graffiti somewhere, you always end up using names of people that you know and <laughs> you know it's because like like in uh like you know old dc or marvel comics it would be like john costanza or somebody like like doing the lettering and, and it's just like that's comic book lettering on that wall <laughs> yeah. like like we need to we need to gussy this up a little bit this guy i don't know how he's gonna meet his end but i really want him to bad yeah <laughs> He's like that little sicko fan. He, you know, he's like a Goebbels or Mengele type character. Man, just wants to be as close to the bad guy as possible for self-preservation. Yeah, he's so ambitious. Also, the cast is so large. Yeah, you know, like we're seeing the the commando guy who's like the first uh, the first soldier that's been in almost from the beginning, and now going to be joined up by compadres later on. Yeah, but but having to make time with like. A terror, a terrorist. You know the guy who's trying to spring those little dudes at the beginning. We say isometric on this. Looks like it, right? Maybe. It's this stuff when you realize that they're not drawing at a ten by fifteen image area. Even it's smaller. You know, like I have some Japanese paper over there. Like I almost should have been prepared for that. Any of this stuff is is really it gets outside of my ability to conceive of how to do it yeah. like if i were tasked with you have to recreate this panel if i was that mangaka that was auditioning i just i, I don't <laughs> i don't know if i'd even try yeah it wasn't recreate it was like trace it like light box it because i think that the root of a lot of this is is that you know like where they have a morgue file and and you know that that's the underlying structure and then yeah gussy it up with some line art but that makes sense it's time, almost time sucker like, you know, sometimes I'll be doing something and I'll have to draw something new or whatever. And you almost figure out a system of how do you draw that thing? Yeah. It's almost like they figured out like some way to do this perfect Tokyo in a state of, you know, half, well, all destroyed, but some buildings still standing and stuff. But it's almost like they figured out a technique for this or Otomo figured out a technique for this. And then, you know, we get to see it over and over again. And it looks like magic as far as drawings go. When you break open that Akira Club book, if there's that fantastic section in the back that has the original release dates of all the um chapters all the mm -hmm. episodes and he doesn't take so much time off while he's making the anime while he's directing that and i was ta i was talking with darrow and and uh you know there's a um, storyboard book that you can actually get now pretty easy you got to go to amazon co j p or uh, the japanese amazon you'll be able to get it um, but he said that, like, to be a director, like, yes, you have to do all the storyboards. Yeah, Miyazaki does all the storyboards, like, for, for all of his flicks and stuff. So what I'm saying is Otomo's doing that. There's two volumes of those, yes. thousands of drawings. While he's doing this, what, what kind of drugs do, does, <laughs> like, what kind of stimulants? Like, that's beyond coffee. I feel like he may be doing those, time machine. those back... Uh, <laughs> exercises that, that, that Frank's telling us about. Like, probably need to put a couple of those in your schedule. When you see their setup, it's such a humble setup. Like, we got drafting tables and shit like that. Like, th it's a small footprint, the studio spaces in Tokyo and stuff. And he just has, like, the little lap board, and it's super humble. And it's the lap board. It's, this is a flat table with that little board that doesn't even go up to, like, a mm -hmm. 45. So he is bent ass over drawing these things man this is a beautiful transition the perspective speed lines and the in the window behind her yeah one of those things you can only do that in comics really like that this ain't something you could point to with a with a camera is that our first tetsuo and akira of uh the issue always bad like th whenever they show up dude it's always a real entrance yeah and your guy your scumbag <laughs> appropriately in awe of seeing a a akira 
they do well with having almost levels of these characters, right? Tetsuo, Hierarchies. amazing. But then Akira is like even rarer air to, to cross paths with. Yeah. You know, I mean, you see him, he's just terrified. He's speechless. <laughs> this guy who never, never shuts up. It gives him the little orphan Annie uh, pupils. And, and they both have it, actually, mm -hmm. at this point, man. That sort of dead eyes. Oh, yeah, this is such a good scene, man. This is the kayfabe, right? This is Tetsuo. He's being tough in front of, like, his yeah. his satellite dudes, his, like, henchmen. But the second he gets through, he's like, no, I got to take a nap. Walking by reminds me of that opening scene with the helicopters. Yeah. Frank, you pointed out, like, you could feel, like, the wind and stuff, you yeah. know, the, the, the stuff coming by. As he walks by, you're getting that same effect on his little minion, you know, just... Just being blown yeah, back too, it, by the by the yeah, radiation, it's just like, a, like a pulse or something. Yeah, just, yeah. It actually puts me in mind of a, that bit in Domu, where the guy's up against the wall and the wall's all caved in and a classic. kind of dish shaped. It's all cracked, but um, just like a gentler version of that. It's more like a, a like a powerful way of dismissing him. You know, yeah. and you even see it in the drapery mm -hmm. of the um, curtain right yeah. there. You like that's getting pushed back. You know, when you describe it, it's his ability to draw the invisible, right? It's like mental energy, it's wind, yeah. it's it's air pressure, it's all these things that you don't actually draw them, you just draw the reaction of them, and really well done. But it's that great move. Like, which Roosevelt was it that had the polio or whatever, man? Like, he, he looked real tough, and nobody ever saw him in his wheelchair like Franklin. while he was on the mic. But then when he gets uh, back by himself, he's toast, man. Yeah. He's got to take yeah. that powder. The body language just sells the whole thing it's all subtle stuff man like just his figure work insane boy the low angle of the aircraft carrier it's amazing looking mm -hmm. to cut between like anguish and exhaustion and in, in just a body to an aircraft carrier cutting through the water what yeah. range and he gives you that right like it's another mm -hmm. one of those cinematic pieces where he gives you that breath This is that shit, man. How do you do it? How how do you how do you do it? Like, forty pages in a month. How how is that possible? I don't get it. I don't understand it. I went out there to try to find the secrets, man. <laughs> I didn't find any secrets. There's that texture that you pointed out before, Jimmy. It's appeared a couple of times. Yeah, that like great. You mentioned Darrow a while ago. As many times as we see these characters from like different angles, it reminds me of Darrow and some of like the Shaolin cowboy when he's fighting and it'll be like the figures flipping through the air and you're getting bizarre foreshortening and, and bodies that's like, you're not photo referencing that because you couldn't put a person in that position. Right. I feel like the Otomo does that consistently, especially as the ship's like leeching back and forth and you're getting low angles, that low three quarter angle. It's impossible. Frank, it's that stuff that, that I notice in your work too, man, where like no head is drawn like straight up and down. There's always a little little pivot, little subtlety to, to these characters, man. They're never just straight on. That's 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 real that's real impressive, man. Look at the what the water coming off there, dude, dude, using white media or just chipping away. I need to see those original pages, man. That was one of those sorely missed art shows, dude. Yeah. Yeah, how did that show not travel? The relationship, the manga relationship with original art is so confusing to me because they hold on to it. They cherish it. Like, There's like, copyright it, issues with it, too. Is that so? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the copyright's different in Japan, which is part of the reason I think they hold on to I it. I see. But like guys like the Kanikumen dudes who have tens of thousands of pages they literally have apartments where they just temperature control them and just have stacks of yeah. artwork in like a modest little apartment somewhere there's that oracle dude such a good character i feel like there's a version of that in um that mad max that that newish that newest one yeah wasn't there like the, some uh, kind of oracle? The, the, the guy well the guy who plays guitar is blindfolded right and he, and he got a big eyeball thing too right i don't know <laughs> these compositions are sick as fuck dude Mm -hmm. where yeah. it's like you frame your your real focal point like in the shadows and you frame them inside of these buildings 
this is there is a correlation to the Wally Wood 22 panels where it's like because he has stuff like window shots, uh -huh. you know, where it's like the actions in the window, but you'll have a character in the foreground. These are extreme examples of it, but that definitely exists. And uh, I always think of Mobius as being like the guy for that kind of extreme perspective where yeah. you're seeing little figures. But obviously, Frank, that's another one that I identify in your work. Um, is that something you feel like you take from from Atoma? Like you recognize that sort of stretching perspective further than than Marvel and DC Comics used to do? Yeah, I, I guess probably that's an influence from Otomo and from Mobius, um, amongst others. But, um, you see those kind of shots in a lot of old movies, too. Definitely. Super far away, like the landscape is extremely mm -hmm. visible. There were some of these kind of bike jump things in Volume 1 that uh, were just so sick, seeing the shadow on the ground like that with the speed lines. It's nice to revisit some of that. Those bikes are so, uh, those are like jump bikes, you know, like like uh, uh, motocross or whatever yeah. bikes, you know, like they're so tall, <laughs> like they're built for that, that spring. These fucking buildings, man. Like if you just drew one of those in your whole life, that's fine, man. Yeah. I like this, this giant character a lot too. That's another one of those kind of yeah. like the Oracle for me where I, I feel like, there's not a lot going on there. Just making him a few heads taller than everybody else is all you need, but also the ability to draw that consistently. And his knowledge of uh, human anatomy, like he doesn't go Marvel Comics with it, where you know, you're know you drawn to every single muscle. It's so subtle. Yeah, it's actually quite like um, giantism, you know, where the, the the whole skeleton is bigger, the the jaw is longer, you know, like... As you see, it's it's not the usual just like bulking up that you would get in superhero comics. It's much more of a kind of believable giantism. Yeah, that's a hundred percent right, man. I also can't help seeing like the rank Xerox eyes. <laughs> you know, those round oh, lenses. Yeah. It's so good for design. Like when you push that character far away, you just have these beacons like shining at you. My goodness. This is a cool yeah. sequence just as like a fan of bikes and stuff, like hopping on the empty subway tunnels and racing through. So humbling. Every panel is a masterpiece. Yeah, they yeah. really are. Conscious choice to never give us this guy's eyes makes him more demonic. But when he wants you to when when he wants that guy to flex, dude, he he really does. This was a matchup that was cool to see, dude. The the colonel and uh, the big giant dude. Yeah, it's a great move. It's such a believable fight in every way. Like getting hit in the head with the rocks, and now we've got the crimson mass coming down. <laughs> and, you know, colonel being tough and wily, but probably no match for that guy on even ground. But you don't have to fight him on even ground, right? It's it's He's a military guy. Like, position is so important. Hits him with the, with the uh, hip toss. Sends a boy yeah, back. Yeah, so believable. It's it's so it's so well drawn, it's so well composed that you you get the movement. You don't need speed lines. You don't need anything. It's just it's just perfect. Mm. We've arrived. Like I imagine that this is like the last panel of a sequence, and then here we are next week. You know, like that's one of the things that like I always find myself doing when I read this. Like, where does it break off uh, as as a unit? And even that. Pausing at the at the open train door, you know here just where your hand is, yeah. And uh, you've you've got the the skeletons of like a kind of mother and child, and it's just that just just that pause in the action, you know. And it's such a contrast to young guys on bikes in a ruined city and subway tunnels that you know like the kind of glamour of it, and then you get that sudden pause for for something poignant. Even the little prey and everything. Yeah, he juggles a lot of stuff because you'll get you get these heavy moments, man. We'll we'll go to barefoot gen moments, you know, but then it'll go to uh, some naked dude with a big ass boner, <laughs> right? <laughs> Standing up in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those filmic transitions, man, where we have uh, Kaneda and his and his homie in the corridor, 
and then cut to Colonel and K. Yeah, it's like, a super yeah. cool. That's one of those very filmic things. Yeah, it's one of those things you can do with directional de devices in a film cutting. You know, like you have your dark scene and like the lit window and then cut to whatever the next scene is. But in that same spot is where your your focus begins. So like the same yeah. kind of uh, compositional repeating. It's one of those visual things like that, that like Alan Moore will talk about in his transitions that, that he doesn't, wouldn't employ as often. He's like a literary transitioner. But the visual transition, that's a, that's a good tool to keep in the pocket. Oh boy, that's two heavy rocks, dude. Like that's what they, that's what they're consigned to at this point. He looks good there. Yeah, you know, like that is a menacing figure. <laughs> good lighting, man. Cutting off the uh, the zips. And it's foreshadowing, right? Like we're not seeing the confrontation yet, but we know they're closing in. And and there's uh there's our lady, man, Miss Shioko. Vulnerable. Even having the rats, you know, in the background whenever they get a chance, whenever this this doc is uh distracted by them. Yeah. So many of those quiet moments, it's amazing. They established these little tank things earlier as like badass. So you feel like, okay, man, they got they got some good defenses. Nah. Yeah, it's a dream match. <laughs> right. There's a lot of wrestling style uh fights going on here. These little psychic pieces throughout. That's one of those things that first time reading it's like a little confusing. That panel with the the two bikes like skidding sideways to a halt, you know, with the the motion trail of the headlamp, you know, and the, the water splashing and the speed lines and everything. It's just just beautiful. Yeah, it's so nuts, man. He I mean he was so good at that from the very beginning. I remember like the earliest like Neo Tokyo's as it's like pushing in to like see the people and you just saw the city streets and it would just be these streaks. It would just have zip a tone for the street and just cut lines like white lines in there to to illustrate uh i thought uh, headlights i just want to show the difference one of the other differences in these additions is this lettering you know the lettering effects being uh the original sound effects are reproduced in this new edition mm -hmm. that kadansha did and i point it out because as we're looking at this page i'm going you know they're so beautiful and then like that lettering feels funny you uh -huh. know that sound effect so one of the differences in these editions is keeping that original sound effect lettering right yeah i wonder which comics started to like keep that stuff because it's such a smart move man because i mean that looks like whiz bang yeah it's font. not it's not quite right and whenever you're looking at like some of the elegant drawing choices it's like hmm it does feel like a different hand <laughs> This kind of stuff I like a lot too, submerged. where your bike's just part submerged, but there's not a lot of drawing there. It's just like this is the cutoff, right? We just have to imagine that's dark water. Using Zipatone like as like a medium, you know, like you never think of it as a medium. You think of it as like a means to an end for some other kind of thing. But like, there's a lot that they're doing with that tool, trying to capture speed with uh, in a single panel with with these wheels. Pretty effective. Yeah, you don't see that often. And more of that water shit. Un unbelievable. Man, the colonel's just busted. <laughs> <laughs> He's had quite an arc too. You know, I remember hating him so much in the early mm -hmm. in the early chapters. <laughs> they all have their arc, you know, like they, they all have a beginning, middle, and end. He keeps the geography of the bandages the same in like every camera angle and every view too, which makes me mad. <laughs> Because there will be parts, like when he's shooting a gun, he's faced this way and then he's faced the other way. He abides by it. I feel mm. like that's how you make this ca this scale of a fantasy work. Like the stuff that you can control or the stuff that has some real life counterpart, you gotta lean into those pieces. When, you, when you're drawing your comics, man, like I don't know about you, but like I feel like I can um, relax and, and just get into that flow state and just like be a part of like what I'm drawing, like I'm not thinking about drawing lines. It's like this is wood, this is metal. But I think stuff at this level, and frankly, Frank, at your level, like I feel like there's a different, deeper level of engagement in in that world, man. That's a really interesting panel. The one you're just pointing to, um, there's a, there's there's a sense of movement and flexibility in that rod that he's about to swing, and it's. It's just done with a kind of almost like an out of register tone. Yeah, it's um, it's quite unusual. It reminds and very me effective. 
of that uh, of the headlight that we saw a couple pages ago, where it's like it's you know you're drawing just the white strip to indicate that light. This has a little bit of that effect. You know, it's not moving as much, mm -hmm. but it has just a little bit of that effect of like, yeah, this is a uh, not a shadow exactly, but this is where it was or this is where it's going as he's like getting into mm -hmm. action. It feels like the fidelity of like old like grindhouse kung fu movies like there will be that trail that yes. would happen sometimes and also just you know curves imply motion and that's not like that is in actuality would be a pipe a straight line but he draws it with mm -hmm. a curve yes uh yeah. Je jeff darrow when he has that um bamboo two chainsaw <laughs> thing <laughs> yes. and the curve in that he always sells the motion and it always feels right yeah, when Jeff does that, it's, it's like you can feel the weight of the chainsaw at the end of it. How do you do that? All of this stuff is believable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, th that page on the left that you just pointed at is just stunning. And then the page on the right, you've got that whole scene. The the architecture really sells it as a as a place you could walk through. This This guy with the glasses constantly needing cigarettes in a in a post-apocalyptic type city where they're not easy to come by there's just there's just so much there's so much richness you know in every scene every location i feel like some of that is autobiographical on otomo's part <laughs> because i do remember uh, there was that one part where the first like encampments were set up in like one of the earlier volumes and they were talking about things of value and somebody brandished some money and they're like we need like antibiotics batteries cigarettes like like that was like you know in the top hierarchy of needs man and you could see uh otomo in like his old interviews there's a little there's a pack of something on a titty pocket <laughs> i think uh, kaneda's arc in this book is like he, he really he really becomes a man here like really kind of takes charge and 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 uh is proactive rather than just like uh voltaire like the the boob uh running around that's a that's a really effective um, introduction to a on the left there where she's asleep, and then you see the feet and you see his shadow. Yeah, man. Mm. And then you see him framed with a light behind him. Yeah, it's, it's very very chunky effective. blood. It is an amazing uh, attention to detail. You know, carrying over that shadow, that screen yeah. no, yeah. onto him. D devote a whole page to that that slow silent entrance it's just loaded with 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 threat that's that's like one of those things that's possible in manga you know like they have this like nearly unlimited page count that they can play with yeah and they can insert these kind of things and we just have to be so much more economical certainly if you're working mm -hmm. in a 22 page structure that has to come out in 30 days or whatever the other thing is like you get this nice slow intro with all the menace coming coming up and then no payoff yet yeah like push it even further yeah. like you've created this sense of dread and, and threat but we're not gonna you, you have to live with that the cat string man <laughs> yeah. keep you strung along this is that bit where he's shooting the guns at different angles and he's never confusing his his head bandages this was such a good set piece too so we have the guy hidden yeah k shows up check out our auntie we have some engagement she's smart too right she's noticing the blood trail coming in here yeah yeah that wamps them a couple of times and then sets that bar in but like imagine trying to write this for somebody else yeah i yeah. I, I don't know how you write that it right. has to be you have to figure that out on the page right that's so sick when you see that man you just expect that our boy's going to be spirit because you've seen that a million that's times. exactly yeah You've seen that a million times in, in movies and stuff. It's like cause, effect. We see this right here. Like, of course, he's going to get impaled, right? No, nah, not this time. Hmm. Something more important than this guy to this guy than his life is getting uh, destroyed. <laughs> Speaking of something important getting destroyed, <laughs> Joker's not going to be happy about that bike. Look at that, dude, just dangling over like. Imagine this makes me imagine like the the Marvel movie version of that because you know it would be like that super bullet time stuff where the the hair would be moving, flowing so slowly and the nuts and bolts would just slowly be bouncing off the ground and look at that piece of body language right there that looks like that's yeah. smart yeah. yeah there's physics there that big guy is so effective now that we've got him in this enclosed area yeah 
His size really is, it feels like it comes through here. It's King Kong at this point. Mm -hmm. Look at these effects. Couple, couple interesting things. A little vibrating mm -hmm. thing here. No idea how this it's is negative. going. Negative. Yes, version. some sort of negative, yeah. I forget. It, would this I, be an effect you could do on a Xerox? Probably some Xerox machines. But even the way the, the big guy gets shot, and the blood still kind of spraying when he's noticing. Right. It's just... Like, because he's so intent on the fight that he's already in. Yeah, and it's not, it's not, it's not vulgar, really. Like, he's getting shot the hell up. But it ain't a Red Room image, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, you see the glasses. You know, once the glasses are coming off, you feel like you're winning. Yeah. It's like you've uh, taken his power away. Wow, this piece here m makes me feel like if you isolated this, I would think that that's that Ryoichi Ikigami, like my the psychic girl mm -hmm. artist, drawing that piece. There's some feathering stuff there. Like every now and then, you could see like what feels like a different hand to me than just Otomo, and I feel like that's like one of them. Little Akira, he's so powerful, he could do everything he wants, man. But he doesn't get to get like a Tempur-Pedic mattress to 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 crash out on. A big old stone throne. <laughs> Again, look at that page in the right where you've got the you've got this the cityscape and then you've got this structure that's in the water with the long shadows. And then you go into the throne and then Akira. It's just it's just it's a, a really amazing page. Yeah, and the lighting is always coming from the same kind of source. Yeah. And it very mm -hmm. strong. Mm hmm Late evening. That's the part I always get jammed up on when you like look at those perspective books about how to like do cast shadows and perspective properly. Do you know how to do that, Frank, or do you fake it? Um, I, I have a, a way of thinking about it that makes a kind of logical sense when I'm trying to work out the perspective, but it's, it's definitely faked as well. It's, it's a co kind of combination of intuition and, and kind of observation and a, a basic understanding but it's a lot of it is fudged okay this is uh this is neat to go through that talking about evening now we're cutting back to the uh i guess the american forces or the international forces that are back on the ship but you see it's the same mm -hmm. time of day you know like we're almost seeing like these different glimpses of neo tokyo and where all the players are at this moment as we're like heading into night yeah. which i can only imagine is the scariest <laughs> time to be alive here <laughs> This is another one of those pieces that, that just feels divorced from, like, everything else. Like, is that 100% an assistant did that? It almost feels like clip art. That's a really interesting one because it, it reads almost like a photo, like a high-contrast yeah. photo. Uh -huh. But, you know, you can look closely and you can kind of see the hatching and the little glimpses. But, again, for selling, like, that evening time, you know, like, that's what it would be, right? It'd be these silhouettes against the evening sky. You know, there are those bits uh, in the... Um in Yo Asano Man Ben episode where he does use high contrast imagery and then he just hits it with the Copic fine liner to, to make it feel more organic. Yeah, I, I don't think that's an uncommon technique for mangaka mm -hmm. to, to bring in a photo and work on it. You're about to say something, Frank. I was just going to say, it actually it works very well on this double page spread because we have these people in an enclosed area inside, you know, having a conversation. And then for one panel we cut to outside looking up into the sky with these these copters coming towards us. So the fact that it's so different um, aesthetically from the rest of the the panels actually really works. It's one of those great uses of words and pictures that you can only do in comics too, where it's like, these boys are tough. And then you get a quick, quick glimpse, true patriots all. Yeah, I was going to say, it's the special forces coming in and that's it's another intro. You know, It feels like every time there's yeah. a new character coming up, there's a perfect intro for them. Mm-hmm. Starting to get our guys back together now. And also night has fallen. Yes. That's a, an attention to detail I always like. Like when you think setting, like time is also part of setting. Yes. You should be able to tell visually what time it is approximately. Certainly day or mm -hmm. night. And it feels like this is like one long moment. So, so it's like we're experiencing it all in quote unquote real time. There are boys, man. They come in their dress blues in the Predator. And they call them children. 
<laughs> which feels appropriate to like what we've seen in all of Akira up to this point. I mean, it's it's a lot of these main characters are children, you know, yeah. some literally. These are 18 year old boys. I like how like he does a, it's that body language thing. Like that character's trying to figure out how to ride that thing. <laughs> yeah, right. How to manage that thing. Like this is this is some expertise. That's like eh, do my best. How hard is it to draw a figure? in that pose, Jimmy, like from that camera angle. This is where you start getting into some real, real cool scale stuff. When you start pushing these little figures further and further, or like as they uh, go to the stadium to see that exhibition of Tetsuo's powers and you get like a bunch of panels of people coming out of the, like, it's like cockroaches coming from behind a wall or something. It also feels the most, uh, you mentioned Mad Max Fury Road earlier. This feels the most like that to me, where it's like you're just scavenging pieces to, to try to create some kind of culture some or totems. Some, something. Right. Yeah, I, w I was actually thinking of the word totem as well there. And it's kind of reminiscent of Lord of the Flies as well. Um, and maybe even Blair Witch. But it's it's certainly, uh, it's, it's, it's so believable the kind of things people might cobble together from what they had to hand. There's that part mm -hmm. in Lord of the Flies, there's that character that needs the spectacles, right? So, and of Thank course, you. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we destroyed the spectacles of that big giant guy. He's and the done. doctor. He's, they're done, man. They're effectively... The one who the one who could see the, the, the situation most clearly was the one with the worst eyesight. <laughs> it's just like when Kaneda gets the, uh, that gets the laser gun at the beginning and then it's like out of juice you know he's got the deus ex machina weapon that's going to take care of everything so that's a tomo fucking with you like <laughs> it's like he's giving you you know the, the finish but then it's out of juice you got to read a couple thousand more pages to get your resolve jimmy draw that in a day man that just feels like some sort of collage photocopy magic right it, yeah i mean i have no idea i don't know either yeah, it's also humbling. Oh, is he fucking with some white zips to create that depth? Yes. Yeah, I've I've noticed that too. That's hard. Yeah. And that on that same page, the 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 first panel with the bandage across the eyes, and you can see the shape of the eye sockets, and then that that middle panel in the top tier, you know, where our arrogant guy is is marching really fast. It's just a it's a great it's a great shot beautiful composition where you have that that uh baby huey coming by man dropping the package yeah before the shoot opens and then it almost stops with the sound effect with it when a, the shoot opens fully. right and you got pa you got panels of this thing slowly coming to the ground yeah and there goes your scavengers it's so funny um you know thinking about all the kids that are in this like it's something i hadn't thought about before two minutes ago but so many of these scenes are like the kids, the followers that are like the first in line for, for the soup or for the stadium assembly or for something that falls out of the sky. It's like, it's all kids, you know? It's all like these resilient, the young people that have survived and still have that energy to keep going. It's funny to think of this as some sort of Lord of the Flies on like, you know, PCP. Neo, Neo Tokyo, <laughs> Lord of the Flies, man. Man, here we go with some of the impossible drawings again. <laughs> Tetsuo showing up in that aircraft carrier. And he just like materializes, right? Like, yeah. like he's he's here one second, sees that that copter is going somewhere, and he just, boom, there he is. <laughs> Almost a thematic callback to uh, his bike mm -hmm. that exploded and got fucked up uh, in uh, Volume One. There's some of that stuff you were talking about, Frank, where it's just that centered image. Yeah. You know, the perspective it's, line is right behind It's a, the Tibetan mystic guy, Karma Tangi, that's, that recognizes first that he's arrived. I like to think that he's a cousin of uh, that Domu guy. Yeah, I, he's, a good, he's a good cousin. <laughs> it's, it, I have, it's all the same universe, man. Like, this is Neo Tokyo, some, like, 20 years after Domu. You know, in a way, his expressions are that uh, expressing something that's invisible. You know, he's so fearful. Like, what, what the anticipation yeah. is, what Tetsuo's, I don't know, ghost is, it's all on his face. Yeah, he's feeling something none of the rest of them can get yet. Yeah, they're all the logic people, and he's the spiritual guy. 
You would see the computer graphics versions of that in the anime. Mm. You know, some super early wireframe computer animation stuff. And look at them just almost like with intellectual curiosity, just having their conversation with this dude. How else could you be? You know, like their whole life is, is essentially studying, you know, this phenomena. And now you're in the same room with them. It's also that thing too, man, where it's it's like, uh, you know, teachers at a university that teach comics. And it's like they have some conceptual idea, but have never made a comic. But now you hear all that stuff you've been learning about. Like, here's some real deal Holyfield shit. How are you going to handle that? great contrast between Tatsuo and them you know like he has the smug look on his face he's not too worried about this he's comfortable he's relaxed he's young and spry they're all old and tense and nervous and just like what's going to happen next great contrasts I'll be honest this part left me a little bit unclear it's something to do with uh like the catapult on the ship and I don't know if he's like like ripping it through the ship or something I'm not sure exactly what he does at that in this moment man I mean, clearly, the you know, it's something very damaging, but I, I don't know exactly what happens there. We'll give him that one. Going back and forth, like, there's, like, the little ticking time bomb that goes off if, if some uh, civilian messes with this thing. Also, you know what, man? Some of the stuff they were talking about, about breaking into the soul computer... And if you just have enough time, you you'll be you could crack a code like that's for something like 1988, 89. That's pretty progressive knowledge. You know what I mean about brute force hacking passwords and shit. Which which also leads me to believe like to wonder about that part of being a mangaka. So you're doing 20 pages a, a week or every two weeks, but now you have to write about something. So where do you have time to read the newspaper and learn about stuff? That's my biggest question about Ghost in the Shell. Like, the science in that, I think, holds up really well. Yeah. I don't know how you had these ideas in the 80s. Right. That's like Kirby Omak kind of stuff. But there are those guys like N Naoki Arosawa who's never stopped making comics since he got into the game. And it's like, you're going to do one following uh, a brain surgeon. So now you got to know about brain surgery, or at least kayfabe it well. And then you're going to do one about a tennis pro. And then, you know what I mean? Like, right. I, I do wonder, like, this part. So he's got this thing. And he, and this guy makes a conclusion using bioweapons. Is it just because it doesn't look like a gun with bullets? Like, is this a, some sort of version of some, some real thing? But he knows that they're, they're using poison. Now we're starting to get our G.I. Joe dudes. Yes. Don't forget about these guys, you know? Very important. Yeah, the different environments are amazing. It's not just that massive cast, it's also like many settings. Everybody has their lair. If these were all toys, you could you could add all kind of play sets. <laughs> Here's some of your graffiti. Yeah, there. one of my favorite panels from, from the whole book. And I love that the graffiti is part in shadow, you know, mm -hmm. just black, and then you get your screen tone for where it's in the light. <laughs> there it is, dude. Olympic Stadium 2020. Yeah, the Kodansha uh, version will have little footnotes, too. I think they have For one the sound on the... Effects. Uh, well, not just the sound effects, but, like, what that stadium is. You know, like, it says Olympic Stadium, whatever year. There's a little bit more of that white screen applied mm -hmm. as, like, atmospheric perspective. Yeah. So you have your seer in the foreground, and part of the way you show it is by having the background building disappearing into the white uh, screen tone. This is one of those really interesting kind of things that you see in... in a lot of illustration where well you see it from time to time where there's lines everywhere but there's clearly a focal point and all of this really is just white noise that it, that it might as well be white but just i don't know the pattern of it mm -hmm. or something just creates like that depth like you don't get lost in it like clearly that's the important thing to be looking at i think it mm -hmm. helps because it's straight lines for all your background and then your foreground is just this like it's not straight lines right it was the the Olympics that were held in in Germany in the in the early 1900s when Hitler was in power and stuff like the Jesse Owens one, where they said that that was like the first time that because video like cameras and stuff were invented at that point uh, film reels and stuff where uh, 
the Olympics was used as like a propaganda tool, and then from that day forward, every Olympics is a propaganda tool for the, for the, for like that country, and that's what this feels like. All this setup stuff is like you know we have these bifurcated or these many kind of clans and tribes and stuff. So this is going to be the propaganda to throughout this entire volume. There have been less and less members of this tribe showing up the great tokyo empire or whatever so this is like the rally the the uh what do they call it let's go the pep rally man to get everybody back on board here's that part with the scale man with these like people just crawling out from holes yeah and just to to, to come to the olympic stadium yeah it's so great of like everybody coming too not just the people the followers of akira but uh everybody everybody's yeah. trying to to get there to kill him as well mandatory it reminds me of um like the like the giant super christian gatherings you know like the yeah. tent whatever. yeah 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 super church shit yeah yeah whatever the, the the name of that but where it's like fifteen thousand people show up yeah for these rallies <laughs> and this guy's wild man he's <laughs> <laughs> such a showman yeah and he's got his hecklers as well in the crowd <laughs> almost everybody man is oh fuck you yeah <laughs> you look like a clown dude <laughs> your flies open all of it none of them taking them seriously but then our guy shows up regal as hell dude that was a mcfarland toy yeah with that background just drawing that background is is nuts that the akira like neon signage no thank you it really is like that that twilight zone episode with that little boy that could conjure up whatever comes to to his mind it feels like wrestling too you know, it's like entrances, right? Yeah. And, and the robes, the songs, the, the pomp and circumstances, like yeah. every every setting is something. Like, again, the play set, right? McFarlane literally made that throne. I've seen Harley Race come out that way a couple of times, man. I've seen Jerry Lawler come out that way many, many times. Got your curtain jerker. You know, this this is like, you talk about Christian mega churches, man, and then there's like Christian mega rock. Church, that's, that's, yeah. Then there's Christian rock where it's like, we're a cool band and... Uh, Believe in Jesus. Uh, McCarthy's uh, par paradox. Yeah, paradox. Pa paradox. Paradox. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good, and and it almost feels like an event like where you want to get past this and see what the big display is going to be. That's the whole idea, man. Like he needs to put on uh, a big performance to 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 create some believers. <laughs> There's your excited uh, fanboy. <laughs> okay, so for, so. Uh, this image is inverted. Mm -hmm. I remember that boner facing the other way in <laughs> the right. Kodansha box set. He'll do that stuff like throughout, you know. We'll try to we'll try to breeze through this sucker uh, because we have to finally get to Tetsuo's demonstration, and it's sold pretty well from from uh, you know it's foreshadowed pretty well. Yeah. Is that the only words that Akira has said so far? The moon. Yeah, it's the only one in this volume. And this is one of those moments, man, that they can drag out with the imagery. It makes me think of like the like the Frank Miller approach and stuff that he talks about that he would uh, put into Sin City, like that car hitting the dude and just rolling up on the on the hood. It like also uh, it feels like if you need to make up some deadline time, you can do a little bit here. <laughs> I mean, this could be a whole sequence, you know. Like, imagine getting your issue a Young Magazine and you just like watched the the moon get pockmarked. I've been drawing cosmic stuff all week for an illustration job. So, like, going through this was really fun <laughs> to kind of see a different angle of that. It's beyond Wally Wood, man. You know? Yeah. Because that's, like, I, that might be, du is that duotone? Nah, there's there's zip dots on there. I was trying to figure out, like, I feel like some of it could be photos, too, once again. Yeah. Like a photo stat. Right. And then paste it down or something. That's what I'm saying. I went out there looking for tricks, man. Found no tricks. So, of course, when you fuck up the moon, man, that's going to create some clim climactic, climatic issues. Cli climactic. Clim yeah, <laughs> climate. Yeah. I guess weather. Climate is a pattern. <laughs> His shirt's too tight, though. He would get busted on in, in Homestead. <laughs> <laughs> this is spectacular. But also, like, Death Star, right? Totally. And, the, and just, like, the thinking about, like, the debris being in orbit of the moon... So Tomo, he ain't no dummy. How about that? Uh, you co-sign that? Yeah, I'm on board for the different face paint. It makes me wish that Sting this... had found this instead of the crow. Right. 
this is this is great the way they slowly start to to realize that the the water's coming it's just yeah they build it and then not only is it water but it's salt water and we're kind of landlocked yeah. so what the hell how where is this coming from a temple even does a bunch of different water like as this water's coming in it's sharp edges like it it, it sells the force of like it's pushing through this tunnel like it would be bursting through a pipe and he does it with those sharp edges which we saw earlier mm-hmm. when the bike was trying to skid through the water it was the same thing you know where like usually it's soft and bubbly but not in this case you know, this is dangerous stuff that's that's such a good note to to sort of keep in mind such a good tool and just why like it's always set up it's always it's always approaching you know and just from the storytelling you just assume that all of this is not there to the next panel and that was a display enough man where the girl's like all right cool let all you little gimp gimpy fucks jump into my head let's do this we got to get serious now There's that reflection again. Yeah. And we got a little... Super cool. Psychic thing happening there. A little Gil Kane montage. The thing's super impressive from page to page, but then you get these moments where it's like above and beyond, like something just really... I don't know. The, the drawing just really steps up. Yeah, it's like it's conceptual. You know, he's clearly trying some stuff. And there's your black helicopters again. All the uh, conspiracy theorists are loving this chapter. <laughs> mm. Yes, man. Mm-hmm. So, so the moon thing happens, and the other kids, the other numbered kids, they know that like if you keep extending yourself, there's a yin yang to that, man. Where you're gonna, your mind is gonna have to compensate for what you just did. Uh, and eventually you're going to lose control and they build that up through dialogue a lot so then the next time when you see Tetsuo and and this is a pathetic image like he's a pathetic Mm -hmm. person after doing the most incredible feat in all of humanity like this is what he's relegated to that ain't a good thing man but then but then he no sells it yeah because the the other kids talk about at some point his uh his personality is going to fall away. And Karma Tangi on the ship is talking about the fact that his body is a prison that the power wants to escape from. And you're getting these clues, but that's the first kind of visual confirmation of something something going wrong. And then just to oversell it to you, man, it's the moon that did it. He also looks kind of Caesarish, with that hair and stuff. Yeah, yeah, very much like a robe that cape he's wearing. Yeah, yeah. The convergence of everybody—it's so impressive. It's—it's it's one of my favorite moments in stories where like everybody yeah. is now coming to this one point, and he has so many players that are coming into that position. This is where Kadeda, like, it was really becoming a take charge kind of, kind of guy. There's that submerged in water. But it's a still moment. Doing her ablutions, right? That's that's just a religious component to that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, baptism, right? Yeah. And then, and then this this is that thing that you get in uh, in pop culture every now and then, where it's like he's been pining over this girl for. 3,000 pages already. <laughs> and it's finally the moment. She's ready to do the do. It, and it's that, it's that like, the plane's about to crash kind of thing. So, like, why not? But he's like, you know what? It just doesn't feel right. It's getting cold feet. Yeah, 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 yeah. He needs that blue chew. <laughs> <laughs> but she's a little zonked, you know? She looks a little zonked. She's She's a gentleman. He's not taking advantage. Yeah. But there's that sweet moment where he bounces. Is that right here? This is great. Yeah, and then he comes back. When they're dropping in, like, look at how 
rough this looks where they're Choppy. heading. Well, yeah, and also like the cities in blackout. And this is poison water, like in floods. Like if the flood doesn't get you, this this brackish, nasty water will. That's that's hard as fuck. It's great. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful poem. He's done this a couple of times, like when Akira wiles out the first time, mm -hmm. you would get these like little uh, uh, squalls Crystals. or whatever. Yeah, and this this is the point when he leaves. The hero moment, man. He's going off to go do yeah. some do some work. You know, he's he's pissing vinegar. He's ready to do his thing. Boom, but then he shows up. Yeah, here it is, man. Then he shows back up, gives her that kiss. Next time I'll stay with you. Like, it's some big prize, man, to have Kaneda. <laughs> they're so close, though. That's such good drawing. They're so close together. Even the shadows on their faces, because they're so close, light isn't even getting in. The shadow sells it. And it's and it's a it's a real dramatic choice, because, I mean, they're close here. You know, but it's they're just that still moment. And it's the stakes, right? Yeah. I'm going to go try to kill this dude before he kills you, and then I'll get... I'll get back. And if he it has, works. And he has no plan. I'm just, I'll choke him. We just saw a dude <laughs> pockmark the moon. Yeah, and, right. he's, and he's gonna kill this. But that's that's the youthful part, right? Like that like that's that's why you want eighteen year olds in this man's army and shit like that, man, because they will have that kind of bravado, that kind of machismo to try to do some impossible shit. Yeah, I think I hung out with only those dudes in high school. I know what you mean. They might yeah. have been the only the only dudes that went to high some school. Some of them got to keep their fingers. <laughs> some more of that white zip. So, mm -hmm. so do you draw a super complicated thing in black line and then you say, I'm going to obscure that with some white zip now? Or do you tell your assistant to draw some super uh, detailed stuff <laughs> and then be like, you know what? Put some white on that. Now. <laughs> this is amazing to me, too, consistently throughout where we go from these like hyper detailed panels and spreads. And then you have like these like more wide open areas to kind of breathe a little bit. Yeah. I don't know how you figure that part out. That feels like a weird intuitive balance thing that maybe one day. He really looks to Kaori as, as his uh, one piece of stability, man. One piece of humanity. And there's a part, like, I feel like I have, like, one or two friends that I've kept since, like, I was a kid. And, it, and to me, it's like, they're my tether to, like, my, my, my old life. My, my young life, man. Like, they know those stories. That's where it's funny with uh, that the characters are kids, you know, because they have these actions that feel like more mature yeah, or figured out. Or is, as an older reader, it makes sense to you through a certain, you know, your own perspective. But with the kids, it's kind of advanced. Now we get to see what else uh, Joker has procured here in the uh, afterworld. He, he is the deus ex machina character at this point, right? Like he's got all the tricks. Microchip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he's getting less ambitious with his makeup, by the way. The tire tread was a good one. But I guess you, should, you sacrifice a tire tread if you have some very complicated backgrounds to draw a couple pages later. Look at the fear. He's a boy. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a little boy right there. He's a scared kid. But he's also scared because he's outed, man, because that's his jack-off arm, and it's way stronger than the skinny one. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Ginza, the fashion district. Now you could go get some Gucci loafers, man, and, and celebrate the end of the world. This is a this is a great scene. We were talking about this character earlier on, and uh, just like the giant when he loses his his glasses when he's getting killed, this is the first time this guy's blindfold has been taken off, um, and it's when somebody that that first panel top left when the, our commando guy, yeah when he sneaks out and he's almost like some kind of creature, right. just like a shadow moving. It's just tremendous. And then of course the blindfold comes off. Um, so that what he's actually seeing with his eyes is, is, is the, 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 the pavement coming up to greet him. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's a sudden, it's a amazing. sudden stop. They get you. <laughs> Here he is greeting his dudes and they were instructed if homeboy seems normal, you listen to every word he says, but if you're the least bit nervous. It's what you were saying earlier on, Jim, about the, the introductions. And we've seen this commando all the way through this the, this book, but this is the first time those those Marines are seeing him, and that's his introduction. He gets rid of that all-seeing eye in the sky. Yeah, that's how you earn your, uh, your men's respect. Yeah. 
This is nearly Mother Sarah mm -hmm. uh, imagery. <laughs> Here's our boy, dude. Starting to absorb nuts and bolts and... You know, he's growing. Like, we keep seeing him now in these bigger, in these big panels. I yeah. talk about him being like these breathing panels, but really it's almost the character is growing in stature. Sure. That head sure is. That hairline. He's got the that, five That arm. Head. He's got the five head, man. You know, like he's the equivalent of these dudes. He gets one page and we get to see like armies right. on, on the following pages filling up the page that's that so, come that's, confront him. That's so true, man. Like we've got a couple big panels. They were all Tetsuo. This is, this is so nice, that crack of light on in the, his face on the top of the page there. Yeah, just as the, as the door's shutting over. It's really interesting. There are times when uh, Otomo will use the zipatone completely to show the shadows and stuff. And then there are the other times where he has the holding line. You know what, Jimmy? Uh, volume 6 time, it would be good to have those epics, uh, as many as, as you have, because uh, there was full Steve Olive, like color shit that over top of the line or that is completely different than this stuff. So I'll tell you, man, going through this volume, I'm so eager now to go back into volume six. Totally, man. That, that pockmarked uh, moon ain't got nothing on our guy now. Cause he's a full on HP Lovecraft. Like this is just a shucked skin, right? Yes. And it's like these, these wires and drains and stuff. It's, it's almost intestinal. Yeah, it's really organic. Some of the wiring stuff almost reminds me of like when you take a Xerox and you move your drawing part way through and the lines just kind of like extend. Yeah. It almost feels like that's him like going off into the abstraction of whatever those lines and wires and tubes and everything are. And it's great the way the Colonel, for all his training, for all that he's been on it the whole way through, just that moment what he's confronted with, which is something he's never seen before. And he doesn't take, by the time Tetsu disappears, he's missed his moment. I like thinking the Cthulhu uh, Lovecraft stuff here, because I think Kaiju was, my, you know, was sort of my impulse, but the Cthulhu stuff really works, it really kind of is that idea of like his personality's gone. Right. You know, it's like something else that's being channeled here. And it's that trying to visualize what has never been seen before with a, with a human brain can't conceptualize classic superhero pose and also the marvel studios joint dude i see barry windsor smith in in certain elements of that drawing no i get it Ooh, now it's domu versus akira <laughs> <laughs> look at that dude just got plucked right in the chest and what's he say that hurt <laughs> And now we're firmly in the territory of like stuff that you kind of see in the anime flick, but like really being able to like expand upon it and, and do a lot more with it. So much more control over the where, where the story's going. This is more that Lovecraftian stuff where you see like this hallway that we've seen so many times with the perfect lines. And now it's this organic mm -hmm. mess. You know, it really feels like you're in a nightmare world. And jeez. And look at this. That first panel where you've got the, what we were talking about earlier on with the, the light behind K, and we've got the, the light being cast from the, the blast in the sky. Um, we've got the light outside the windows in the second panel, and then we've got that incredible brightness of the, the first panel on the second page, just burning out. And then zooming in to just a section of that, just the the black and white. It's kind of chaotic looking. It's just, it's amazing choices that he's making. It's that contrast thing to sell the brightness. Like this is a different level of bright than that because of that contrast. Mm -hmm. The water being white too, and just the line for the surface. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. This is one of those sequences where it's like this is what it's all about. You know, these are people who have dealt with the bomb, and it is now firmly a part of their culture. It's neat how the yeah. smoke resembles some of the forms that we've seen to Suo's, like, whatever he's turning into. Yeah. <laughs> kind of resembles that, like, 
curling and turning and organic shapes. Interesting choice, like the haze with the zip over top of the line. Like that's that's done for a reason. Mm-hmm. It's like what coming back into focus or something. Yeah, it's like a blurring. Yeah. And now this is not the impotent little boy crying on a girl's lap. That's over. Yeah. This dude has a super cool haircut and looks intense. He gone super saiyan. Reflection in the visors of that white. You really want him to draw this once and then just like put a photocopy right there, right? <laughs> That's right. That's what I want him to do. <laughs> and the, op- the opposite page there up the top, the uh, the military guy, yeah, in top right. He's just, he's walking to, along the corridor, but he just... He's just glancing at the the deformed wall that's bulging out, you know? He knows this, this, is, this ain't good. No. You yeah. Know, this is titanium this is my or something. Ship. Yeah. You're, not, you're not trained for this. There's no part <laughs> of his training that covers that. What was that one? Like, is it the Manhattan Project or uh, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia experiment? experiment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, that, like that's going through his mind right now. This moment of, like, recognition... That- with that pilot. Yeah, that exchange between the pilot and Tetsuo as they pass each other. Frank, and this... then one of the pilots in the next page says, you know, like, nothing on deck or something. Maybe nothing it's a unusual pilot. on deck. I don't see anything. This reminds me of, of, of your work in a way. Like, I feel like this is something that, I don't know, affected you in some way, spoke to you. There's something about the scale and the stillness and the moment. Like like some authority era, yeah. Just or just, I always think like comics are really great. You you find the right moment to pause. Ah uh, yeah 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 yeah. For and, sure. and this has that moment of like, I don't know. It's godlike. There's, There's a lot just of something that, that's just massive. You know everything's implied. I know what happened for ten seconds before this and ten seconds after this, and this is the greatest moment to like stop and he gives two pages for that when are, when are the other times he gives this kind of real estate giant explosions kind of directional devices with the uh it really is speed lines is this about where uh you discovered these comics that is, or is this the first stuff you saw frank yeah i guess so Amazing. The thing that really, the thing that really sticks out is when he actually starts fusing with the so so that that panel on the left, where the the, the aircraft is starting to kind of like fuse around his body. Yeah. Um, and the, that that top panel uh, on the following page says the monster, and he, he's like this parasite, this creature that's attached itself to the aircraft and it's controlling it it's just a so this is these are really early memories for me of of the first time i saw akira there's that old i think it's a world war ii phenomenon of the gremlins Mm -hmm. on uh the airplanes that are the people that like you know the little creatures that take the wing nuts and stuff off the wings it makes me uh it makes me want to see the color version you know the steve olaf version of the interpretation of that and he's still, Tomo's still attention to character detail, right? Like, characters are still doing stuff like, give me those binoculars. <laughs> I'm your superior. I need to see this. <laughs> and here oh. we go, man. Techno-organism. That panel bottom left, where the, where the, the plane is, is listing slightly and the heat-seeking, heat-seeking missiles are coming in, following it round. It's just such a good sense of, of movement there. That's another one of those timing panels that, again, I associate with your work a lot. Uh, it, it feels like that. It's like, when do you stop the pan? When do you give us the moment in this panel that, that says the most? Our boy has gone around the bend, man. This plane's upside down. This is uh, some storytelling stuff that he played around with in his one short story called Memories, which has that mm-hmm. magnetic rose story Mm -hmm. and whenever oh yeah yeah and that's and that's very kubrick uh but whenever you've seen the guys talking in the ship they're always the camera always changes they're upside down like they're facing different and so like Mm -hmm. this plane it's doing a barrel roll yeah yeah and not without a target (laughs) yeah by the way man that target like that shows you how far away this plane is from that because that thing is a city on on the water Dun, dun. You know that you know the soundtrack, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's neat how these things mirror the missiles. Yeah, you know the trial of the missiles or 
Mm-hmm. That is way too close to be to a fucking missile, dude. <laughs> That's so cool looking. <laughs> That's who they, is looking rough. They give it the best shot, dude, and he still kind of is smiling. He'll read your heart. That's a great background for her coming back. Yeah. That's such a cool visual. Got a reunion. Miss Chiaco is is back. Is back in business. She would have been a good one to fight that giant. Yeah. You know that would have been a good showdown. I think we saw yeah. that. Was it yeah. in one of the earlier volumes? I think so. Did, did did he put her in that position? It's been a while. Yeah, I can't remember. She also makes me think of that big Native American dude from uh, Cuckoo's Nest. Hmm. <laughs> Juicy fruit. <laughs> And there it is, dude. Yeah. Look at that page in the left. The cityscape and the the, the rolling road that's all cracked. Oh, shit. Yeah, man. Yeah. And then them all coming towards us and their, their bikes. Some Just... of the glass is still in, in the window. Some isn't. And, mm. and when it's not, he's doing like, he's drawing like little office buildings in there, man. There are even panels that have like pieces of glass in there. <laughs> That's messed up. It is. It's too much. Oh, uh, dude. And you get to see the, um, like the joke the is on stadium. the stadium. Yeah. That's so sick. Then between the buildings. Yeah. That's so he sick. He just, lo he just looks to his left and ca catches a glimpse of it as he's flying past. He has some geography now. Homeboy knows where he is. Special forces dude shooting some people up. And then. This is like so Japanese to me. It's like we got rid of the giant. Now we have Eggplant Man. <laughs> he calls himself that, right? Yeah. Eggman. Eggman. I think he called himself Eggplant Man in the. Uh... And this, the way the way he grabs that guy's heart, yeah, and just says squish. says squish as he closes his fist, and you turn the page expecting to see blood, and it cuts to a different scene. We just know what happens. Yeah, it's, man. It's, it's so hard. <laughs> Finally, has his own FaceTime. With Akira, what a way to end this thing. It's hard yeah. not to have to read volume six after you finish this one. Yeah. There's so much momentum for it. Yeah. There it is, man. Just what you were saying earlier about when all the characters start converging, you know, and you've got you've got this impossible showdown, you know, and what's he going to do with it? I, I wonder if, like, yeah. as they were selling this stuff, if, if all the readers knew that this next volume is a lot, it's over. You know, like, the volume five is going to be the... We're in the home stretch. It's all going to be done soon. Because so many of those stories, I mean, it's 27 volumes worth of stuff. It's 30 volumes worth of stuff. Google 13 still going on. Uh, but if you allow the people, if you sell people on the idea that this last one, it's going to be it. Like, that, that, could be, that could be some epic stuff. Frank... Thank wow. you so much, man. That was a pleasure. Inspiring. Absolute pleasure. Inspiring, man, to, to, to go through this thing with you. And, uh, Jimmy, when you hit on some of the things that you sort of identify with uh, Frank's work, I, I sort of concur, man. Like, uh, there's definitely some, some spiritual similarities, man. And, and uh, I, I don't want to say virtuosity, because that would uh, disregard all the goddamn hard work you've done over time, man. But definitely hold you up in the same pantheon dude so it was a pleasure to go through this volume with you especially since the shoot interview when you mentioned this volume specifically man like i felt like we had to save it for this kind of moment people have been hounding us to keep going with akira had to wait for the right moment i mean it was a it's it's great that you asked me to to join you for for volume five because it includes the the my first introduction to akira um, false modesty aside, I'm I'm not in the same pantheon as this guy. He, Otomo and Alex Toth and Mobius are three of a fairly short list of of creators that are absolutely in a, a league of their own. Um, and when you see when you see elements of of Akira that remind you of things in my work, it's just because. I've been influenced by him, you know, um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's such a, it's, there's so much in his work. There's, 
and and we 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 touched on it here, but I mean, like, you could spend so much longer. I mean, you could you could actually say quite a lot about every single page in That's that true. comic, and you can't do that in a you know like when you're having a conversation for an hour going through it and. Um, and for most people that aren't making comics themselves, they don't want to hear that level of detail anyway. But um, his work has got a, a level of richness in every area that very, very few creators can get to, you know? And it, he's so inspirational. He really is. Um, I think there was a lot of, uh, like, a sphere of influence. I. I think I think it was Jeff sent me a photo and was like, "You recognize these people?" And it was like the Wachowskis. It was the uh, animation director Rentaro. It was Mobius and Otomo all chilling in the same room. Jeez, just hanging out, <laughs> man. Just hanging out. They respect one another. But then there's like Otomo. I have some old Otomo books where he's uh, doing references to Fritz the Cat and Robert Crumb, who I think is actually another one of those guys who, who has his own world, his own language, like sort of his own kind of, uh, he, he's in a league of his own when it comes to uh, artwork and, and comic book making and stuff. I think of Robert Crumb? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he's, he's, in some respects, he's a total pioneer, you know, and absolutely fearless, you know, um, and I know some of his work is is generally seen as somewhat objectionable now, but you know, like what a contribution he's made. I mean, he's just he he is another one who's really in a league of his own. Yeah. I think one of the great things of Akira, and it speaks to that richness that you that you mentioned, Frank, is the rereading. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I've been reading this book. I don't know when these Dark Horse volumes came out. That's when I first got hold of these things, but probably in the early 2000s, late like 20, 90s, 20 years ago, somewhere sure. around there. And I feel like I've been reading them ever since, like going back and picking yeah. up the some of the color volumes just to see sort of how that works. But then also Kadansha re releasing that new set. It's like, it's a great reason to go through them again. Um, and I feel like yeah. I'll be reading them the rest of my life and finding new stuff in there. I'll check it out like once a year, every other year, something like that, man, to just kind of get yeah. reacquainted. And, and just it's good to wash yourself in, in this kind of uh, consideration for, for the page, the things that can be done with the page with subtlety, body language and stuff. There, there's not uh, avalanches of text on every page to give you your expository. Right. Uh, what you should be th telling you what you should be thinking about the characters he handles that also subtly uh he has the page count to to do everything he wants to do it's a humbling work man and uh yes. super super cool to go through it with you frank let me ask you man uh any comic book artwork in the future like what's what's going on um i am three pages away from finishing something i'm doing with mark miller just now um so I've been kind of doing it all the way through lockdown and I keep stopping and doing other things. Um, obviously, I've also been doing covers, but it's really only Mark's thing and covers that I've done comics-wise during lockdown. Um, I've, been doing some, uh, I've been doing some illustration work outside of comics, uh, which, is, which has been really refreshing. It's narrative illustration. It's, it's storytelling in single images. Um, and uh, I've I've written a bunch of short stories that I want to get around to drawing myself at some point, and uh, but people just keep offering me things that are <laughs> are interesting or well paid or whatever, you know. And it's such a temptation to when you work with somebody you haven't worked with before, or if you're doing a job that's that's new to you, you know, or working in a different field or whatever, you know, it's it's always a it's always a temptation to to go and do something like that. But um, yeah, so I don't know when the, I think the thing I'm doing with Mark is getting solicited within the next month or so, because he's, he's actually been hassling me about where the last few pages are. So it, that's coming soon. Um, and it's a, it's a thing where Mark's written a bunch of, a bunch of um, issues and he's got, he's got different artists doing different issues that deal with different characters so um i'm i'm looking forward to seeing the whole thing when it comes together a bit like grant's multiversity thing you know i kind of did my own piece pax americana 
in isolation and then without really knowing what was going on with the rest of the story and who the other artists were and all the rest of it. And then when you see the whole thing come together, it's, it's actually pretty satisfying. So I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be a, a somewhat similar scenario. That's very exciting to hear, man. We've, we've been deprived of some uh, Frank Whiteley pages for some time, man. So, so it's awesome that you're getting back to the comic game. And uh, would you come by uh, Cartoonist Cafe again when this thing is announced and out there, uh, come by the channel, promote it, and chat it up a little bit? Sure. Sure. Of course. Sounds great. Good to go, Jim? I am. Frank, thanks so much for coming by. Uh, much appreciated. Okay. Let's do it again whenever uh, you get these three pages done. Uncle Mark Miller, sorry we kept Frank so long, but we had to talk <laughs> about this volume of Akira. It was important for the good of the culture of comics. That's right. And I needed somebody to blame for being late with Mark. <laughs>